thank you. All right, a warm welcome to all of you uh, to this, uh, one of the key, key highlights of this conference. Uh, we, have, we are privileged to have Professor Thorsten Beck uh, to give us a keynote speech. He's an important researcher in the field of FinTech in international circles. So uh, to, to give a brief introduction, uh, like if I have to introduce him completely, that will take a long time. So I'm trying to minimize my time to, so that we can have him speak more. Uh, professor Thorsten Beck is the director of Florence School of Banking and Finance and professor of financial stability at uh, European University Institute. Professor Thorsten Beck is a research fellow also of uh, Center of Economic Policy and Research, CEPR and CSIFO. Before this, he was a professor of banking and finance at Bay School, Business School, formerly well known as Cross Business School, in London between 2013 uh, and 2021. And he was professor of economics from 2008 to 2014 and the founding chair of uh, European Banking Center, uh, Center at Tilburg University, uh, Netherlands. Previously, he worked in research department of World Bank from 1997 to 2008. And over the past 12 years, he has been consulting various international organizations such as European Central Bank, Bank of England, the BIS, the IMF, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the European Commission, the German Development Bank Corporation. His ideology of research focuses on two key questions and very important questions, I would say. What is the relationship between finance and economic development? And the second that he focuses on is, what are, what are the policies needed to build a sound and effective financial system? In addition to the numerous academic publications, which are many, uh, in leading economic and uh, finance journals, he has co-authored several policy reports on access to finance, financial systems in Africa, cross-border banking, and he has research and policy experience across large number of countries across the world. He holds a PhD from the University of Virginia and MA from the University of Tübingen in Germany. We are privileged to have you, sir, and uh, uh, we look forward to your presentation on uh, digitization of finance, opportunities, and challenges, and we hope that all the researchers here are going to have a great takeaway from your presentation. But before we start, uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Sanket Mohapatra to welcome uh, Professor Thorsten Beck. Uh, with a bouquet and a memento from I am and the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so we have one hour of uh, presentation scheduled uh, that will have some Q and A as, yes, on, uh, as per your wish. Okay, thank great. You. Okay, well, thank you very much. Actually, I don't have, I don't need this part. Right, I think this one works. Right. So yeah, yes. Right. Okay. So actually, I don't need my, uh, I don't need this microphone. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, number one, for the hospitality, uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's my first uh, post-pandemic trip to Asia, and uh, I think it's uh, very nice that I'm here in uh, in India, and my first time here in Ahmedabad. Um, so this conference is about innovation, inclusion, and regulation. And I, I think, actually, uh, I will manage to talk about all of these three items um, uh, over the course of the, uh, the next uh, uh, couple of minutes. Um, now, to kind of start off, um, if you think about um, innovation, financial innovation, then it's often the idea that uh, this time is different. And I would say yes and no. Um, financial innovation as such has happened throughout history. Um, so if you go back the centuries that we've had uh, financial uh, transactions, financial instruments, financial markets, institutions, um, there has always been some kind of uh, uh, innovation. Um, so I'm currently based in Florence. Florence is actually the uh, where uh, double entry bookkeeping was uh, uh, invented some I don't even know, 500, 600 years ago. Um, but somewhat closer to the, um, to, um, uh, to the, the current times, uh, investment banks were founded in the late 19th century to finance, for example, the railways in the, in the US. Um, 
ATM, also known as cash machine, uh, which nowadays we kind of take as given that uh, it's only like 50 years old, um, uh, which of course then also enable people to get access to cash outside uh, um, uh, branch hours. Uh, mutual funds, um, so not having to put, uh, being uh, necessarily having to put money into uh, deposits, uh, but uh, for example, money market funds, which give slightly higher interest rates, or mutual funds where we, uh, where we pool uh, uh, funds for equity uh, debt investment. Venture capitalists, um, uh, important for financing of certain industries, startups in certain industries, such as the IT industry, which are typically not funded by banks uh, because they're very limited tangible assets that can be used as, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as collateral. So if you look again, their financial innovation has been around forever. New instruments, new um, institutions, new type of institutions, um, but also new kind of techniques. Just another one: credit scoring, how to assess the uh, uh, the credit worthiness of a uh, of a uh, of a borrower. Um, which actually, I remember one of my first jobs as an intern at Deutsche Bank was to kind of uh, work on an Excel sheet that was kind of a basis for a credit scoring. I mean, of course, we're talking about 20th century here. Anyway, so. Now, is this time different? Yes, to a certain extent, um, because there has been a wave of new technological innovation, which ultimately has been the basis for financial innovation. Um, digital revolution, mobile phone, uh, internet, I'm going to talk about this more in a moment. Um, but then also, based on especially the internet, the explosion of data that is being created, also by ourselves as clients. Um, the, the, the ability to actually process it, for example, in the form of machine learning, in the form of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and of course, and as finally, I'm going to talk not as much about it, but uh, um, uh, these, these, um, uh, these decentralized ledger technologies, DLT, uh, uh, um, blockchain, and so on, uh, that gets another uh, kind of um, uh, financial innovation, which I'm personally am seeing lot, lot, lots more, uh, a lot more critical. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to talk much about this um, uh, uh, in this in, in this talk. Um, just to kind of, um, I mean, we've talked about this during the last uh, day and a half. Um, what is, is actually fintech? I mean, you can think about lots of different uh, definition. Um, uh, I'm, I'm using one here, which is from the uh, Financial Stability Board, which basically says it's technology we enable financial innovation that could result in new business model, applications, processes, or products with an associated material effect on financial markets and institution and the provision of financial services and maybe to add also implications for financial stability. So it's not just financial innovation as such, but driven by technological innovation and with a material impact ultimately on the way we, we, uh, we use financial services, we access them, but also for market structure, regulation and uh, stability. Um, one can think about this innovation being um, adopted by incumbent players, by existing uh, um, financial institutions, or about new institutions that come in using technology to challenge existing players. Um, another big difference, which I'm going to talk about later, is uh, between fintech and big tech, but fintech is focused on financial services, and big tech are these platform companies, uh, Facebook, uh, PayPal, um, Alibaba, and so on, that uh, kind of reach out into uh, the financial services from other sectors. So, um, innovation. Let me talk briefly about inclusion. Um, the kind of the second item here, the second theme. Um, and of course, I know that, I mean, India, so India is one of these countries that has made enormous progress over the last uh, couple of uh, years uh, in terms of inclusion. Um, has also had many different initiatives about how to go about this, including now also a, uh, uh, an ID-based uh, kind of outreach effort. Um, but if you look across the world, um, uh, there is a lot of variation still in access, in the use of financial services. Um, this is the latest data uh, from uh, uh, 2021, uh, which, as you can see, there's a couple of blank spots, which is because of the pandemic, there couldn't be, there wasn't any uh, uh, data collection. Um, but if you looked actually at this picture more 10 years ago, 2011, it would have looked much worse. Um, especially in Africa, for example, uh, there used to be a time when at most 20% of the population in many countries had actually access to a, uh, uh, to a, a bank account. So we're not talking just about lower income, but also large parts of the middle class that uh, didn't have access to a bank account, which has changed quite dramatically. Not necessarily the access to uh, 
bank accounts, but to financial services through other delivery channels. So let me come back to this in just a moment. But um, so I, I've talked about this already for mobile phone uh, technology, and that has been especially important for uh, for access to uh, financial services, as I'm going to give you an example in just a moment. Uh, new delivery channels, and importantly, given that the um, cost of transaction per per transaction um, per client uh, is much much lower. It allows the exploitation of economies of scale. Big data, again, as basis for um, better risk measurement and risk management. And then the DLT, uh, which, again, I'm not going to talk about as much about, which kind of led, uh, led to this rise of the uh, decentralized financial system, which is actually very, very small still, hasn't really much, um, but of course has, has uh, attracted lots of headlines. I think it hasn't really um, uh, contributed as much as we would like to, uh, it to contribute. So more generally, if you think about digitalization, it is really, um, it allows a larger distance between provider and consumers. You're not uh, relying anymore on access to a branch. Um, also, you don't rely anymore on personal relationships, on personal contact. It's all about over the phone, internet. Um, but it also allows for higher transparency, which again, reduces the, the monitoring cost. So overall, and uh, another interesting uh, um, uh, challenge has been, uh, as uh, pointed out by Thomas Philippon, that uh, intermediation costs have been kind of stubbornly constant at around 2%, um, uh, which you can think of like as a spread between lending and, in, and deposit rates for the last decades, even though we've seen financial deepening. Um, uh, but the only reason, and which could be explained with market structure, lack of competition, and so on, but it seems that recently it actually has gone down a little bit, uh, and that might again be due to the to digitalization. So, um, again, I showed you, I think this, this they, they might not be in the right order. So, inclusion, lots of progress, and part of this progress has been actually due to technology, due to what we call the mobile money accounts. And here you can see. Um, uh, uh, for example, high-income countries, uh, so sorry, this is the, the mobile money accounts, the, the purple one, um, standalone or together with financial institution, and basically shows over the, par over the past three waves of the global uh, FINDEX indicator um, how much uh, of the increase in the use of financial services has been due to mobile money accounts. And as you can see, not much in high-income countries where this is already, uh, the inclusion is already very high, but a lot actually... Uh, um, 10, 15 percentage points in, uh, in many uh, um, lower income, middle income, uh, and generally developing economies. So their technologies, um, uh, actually, yeah, it says here eight percentage points, sorry, only eight. Um, I thought it was more. Um, uh, but still a very big uh, um, uh, uh, increase uh, due to that, um, uh, uh, due to that uh, technology. Um, it might actually, you can also think about it, um, this is of course only the direct effect, but of course you can think about by banks getting under competitive pressure themselves also reaching out more, so there might be an additional inter, inter, uh, indirect effect. And again, lots of reasons why this has been successful. Um, again, much smaller costs per transaction. Um, you work with uh, um, an agent network, which is much cheaper than branches. Uh, lower documentation requirements, which has also been enabled by uh, regulation. And also, very importantly, um, at least in the region that I've done lots of work in, in Africa, there's also a trust issue. People don't like to go to a bank because they don't quite trust them because there has been a history of bank failure. Um, here, uh, to establish trust um, can be done immediately. You send something uh, over the phone to somebody else, uh, you can check within 30 seconds whether the money has arrived or not. And ultimately, and that of course goes back to the whole debate on microcredit or microfinance, um, it seems that, uh, I mean, so for many years, or even not even decades, we've talked about um, microcredit as kind of, uh, when we were referring to uh, financial inclusion, including um, uh, the, the year of microcredit in, I think, 2005 or six. Um, however, it seems that payment, access to payment services might be a much more immediate need for many unbanked, uh, for a large share of the unbanked population. So that, of course, uh, digitalization can also help here, at least as an entry point into financial services. So let me talk very briefly about uh, M-Pesa. So M-Pesa has been kind of the often seen as a poster child uh, because it has been one of the first um, uh, mobile money um, uh, um, providers. Um, uh, it had um, a very kind of um, 
a conducive environment in which it started. Number one, uh, Vodafone or Safaricom had a already a dominating uh, market share in Kenya, which allowed them to roll it out and to kind of get immediate like big market share also in mobile money transactions. Uh, basically decided to say, okay, guys, we, I don't gonna, not, I'm not going to regulate it from you from day one. I'm going to put in some safeguards, uh, but you can try it out. Um, uh, you have to, uh, the money that uh, you collect uh, or that the, uh, that uh, people hold in the mobile money account has to be held in a in a escrow account uh, with different banks. But other than that, we are only going to regulate at a later stage. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, and that's kind of also helped the uh, um, Safari comment and M-Pesa to be so successful. And successful it has been, I mean, these are actually old numbers now, I should update them. But I think um, uh, even within four years, 70% of households had such an account. Um, the, also the transaction volume has gone up enormously. And these are really small transactions. This is, um, I think more recently also international, but not as much. So there have been several studies that kind of show that this actually has been very helpful uh, for consumption moving because you can sh uh, share resources uh, across uh, different family parts, um, uh, but also and, um, sending money through bank accounts. I mean, if you don't have one, you cannot do it. Um, the alternative was always to send it with the, the bus driver and then go to church and pray that it actually gets to the other side. Um, so there was lots of, the, the alternatives were really, really limited in terms of uh, sending money and PESA really solved this problem. Now you could say, well, this is just about payments. Is there something else that can, that can be helpful? And actually, so um, again, there have been lots of studies looking at um, how this has helped households. Um, we actually did a study that uh, looked at uh, uh, small enterprises. Um, so at some point, uh, this mobile money uh, was also rolled out to small traders, small uh, like uh, restaurant service providers and you know, small repair shops, uh, which basically also offered them the opportunity for uh, them to accept payment. Now, one additional thing I have to mention is that, that uh, especially in Nairobi, where we did the survey, is a city which, uh, at least back then, and probably still is, uh, a very high crime area. Um, so if you deal with cash, there is the risk that you will not be able to repay your provider because it's going to be, you're going to be assaulted or it's going to be stolen or whatever. Um, so this high crime introduces an additional risk premium, which of course is taken into account by suppliers when they decide whether to give you credit or not, whether to supply something to you based on a 30 day or 60 day uh, uh, time uh, payment horizon or not. Um, um, so basically, um, uh, the, the mobile money was kind of a way around this. Of course, it comes with a cost, so there's a trade-off. Um, it's safer because um, including the supplier knows that um, if you use mobile money, you are more likely to actually repay him or her uh, than if you use cash. On the other hand, there's a slight, uh, uh, a very small cost involved too for these transactions. Um, so what we show here actually, and so we have uh, we have a little model, and then we calibrated with uh, um, with the survey data that we uh, that we undertook in Nairobi. And what we show basically is that um, uh, there is this positive supply credits and using mobile money accounts. This is being used more by people who are also by entrepreneurs that are more uh, productive. For them, therefore, the the cost uh, of using mobile money weighs less than the risk of uh, of uh, cash uh, cash use. Um, and ultimately, so it, it, it's not, not nothing to do with bank credit, but it's basically you, a more efficient payment technology allowing people to get better access to supplier credit, better funding, better funding conditions. Ultimately, back of the envelope, you even find there is a, a positive uh, macroeconomic effect of this mobile money use by entrepreneurs. So that's um, quite, uh, um, uh, quite reassuring. And again, this is completely outside. So, so in, a, in this very kind introduction, you mentioned the, uh, my, my finance and growth work. You can say this is also about finance and growth, but it's actually kind of a very different type of finance because it's not the, the finance that we typically pick up when we, when we talk about aggregate indicators of financial development. So a second um, paper I want to briefly mention in this part of my presentation um, is now going from FinTech to Big Ten. Um, it's going to a, uh, to a platform company, um, Alibaba, um, uh, the end group, um, which uh, is one of these typical uh, big platform companies, think Facebook, uh, Google, uh, and so on, um, that, or Amazon, that start out in one sector and then kind of um, uh, expand into other sectors, uh, into other services, and ultimately, uh, through what some people have called the development uh, strategy, are actually uh, able to also go into the financial services area. How do, can they do this? Because they have uh, 
lots of data on their potential clients. Um, they have the, 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 the benefit from network externalities, meaning that um, many of them have really market dominating positions. Um, I mean, so in China, there are two, Tencent and Alibaba. Uh, Facebook is currently kind of one of the big providers, of course, in social media. Google, in terms of, uh, uh, at least in the Western world, in, uh, in terms of search machines. Um, so they really have uh, typically uh, almost kind of like natural monopoly positions uh, due to the network externalities. And of course, you can also use AI, ML for basically um, for example, assessing the credit worthiness of their, of their clients. Um, so there is a lot of um, benefits that they take from service provision in um, other sectors, for example, e-commerce, and then also offer financial services. Um, of course, there was the, um, in China, there was the additional condition similar to Kenya, that there was a very conducive uh, regulatory framework in the sense that the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the banking authority, the regulatory authority basically said, well, yeah, we need more financial inclusion, we need more guys, just go ahead. Uh, that actually has kind of turned around over the last couple of years where they got more skeptical of the, uh, the impact uh, of big tech. So um, just to kind of give you the, the setting, um, so if, uh, and I actually had the, the, the chance to see it myself, so my, actually my last trip to Asia before the pandemic was to China in 2019, um, when um, uh, basically I, 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 I traveled to China with a couple of um, uh, uh, local builds still, um, um, uh, Remini builds um, and Yuan builds, um, and I went home with the same builds because I couldn't use them because cash wasn't being used anymore in China. So what you basically do, when, wherever you go, um, if it's, I think, up to a certain limit, um, uh, you pay basically by taking out your phone, um, scanning a QR code, and off it goes, and that's it. Um, so, uh, which of course is much more efficient, um, and it also um, is efficient, especially for, for smaller firms, because um, you don't need this POS, this, uh, this little machine, which is, um, so even all you need basically, even if you are a shoe shiner, all you need is to print out a piece of paper with the QR code, and off you go and make money and get the money into your account. Um, so now if this, um, so what and Financial did is basically offer this kind of services to really kind of small uh, traders, small uh, service providers. Uh, in turn, of course, through the QR code, through these transactions, they get uh, information about uh, these uh, small traders, um, which then ultimately allows them to kind of what's called a network score a credit rating, and then basically decide should they offer them financial services or not. Should they offer them, sorry, should they offer them a credit line or not? Which some um, did, they were offered a credit line, and some have actually also used it, not all of them. And then ultimately, um, by um, um, gaining, by using the credit line from and financial, um, they, the information about this firm also showed up in the credit registry, and ultimately some of these firms also got then uh, uh, bank credit. So yes, so this is, um, um, let me just try to go through, so it's not the whole time, not the whole population, we have a random sample over a, a couple. Um, and um, uh, so there is of course a big difference between, um, these credits were basically based, uh, by the way, channels through this my bank, so it's not directly by the big uh, tech uh, credit itself, it's provided by, uh, by my bank. Um, now, if you can see, there is of course a big difference between these uh, kind of the bank credits and the this kind of big tech credit in the sense that uh, big tech credit is much more short term so basically credit lines rather than the uh, the bank credit which is more uh, a longer term which is also larger by the way a larger amounts so um how does um, um what is the probability that once you start using qr code as payment technology you get access to a credit line you get offered a credit line so it increases over time as the big tech uh, uh, collects more information it is more likely that you actually also get a, uh, a credit uh, offered. And actually after three years, uh, it's 80% likely or so four out of five firms actually get a, a, a offered a credit line. And again, this can be very small because again, we talk about very small enterprise. Um, does the offer of a credit line lead to more use of bank credits? No, because the banks cannot observe that. But the use, once you start using the credit line, yes, again, not everybody, obviously, but some, uh, once you're uh, using credit line, your information is being also reported to the public credit registry to which the banks have access, then also over time, it becomes more likely that some of these firms actually also get offered bank credit. So there's this kind of positive spillover effect. 
Um, there is heterogeneity in these spillover effects in the sense that it's um, 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 actually the, the less connected firms that are more likely. Um, female entrepreneurs are more likely, and actually people, less wealthy people, so people without uh, property are actually more likely to get, uh, uh, to benefit from this, um, from this spillover effect. Um, finally, and um, uh, to discuss again back to financing growth, um, does actually this have a real in, uh, um, effect, um, this excess in the use of credit lines? Um, yes, it does. Um, um, there's a slide after the introduction and after the, the firms start using these uh, credit lines, there is actually a somewhat higher growth in sales uh, for these firms than for other firms. And this was actually uh, uh, more striking during the, um, uh, after the first lockdown in China, so after recovery, uh, firms with access to a uh, big tech credit line were faster in their recovery than firms without it. So, in summary, um, again, um, this kind of creating a digital payment footprint can allow these firms get access to other financial services. Um, and um, ultimately, this has kind of positive spillover effects um, uh, to also getting access to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to bank credit. Uh, so, it spills over into other segments uh, or the segments into the, of the incumbent, uh, the formal financial system, and actually also with positive uh, real uh, effects. So, um, kind of summary um, of this, this part, the inclusion part. Um, uh, so, lots of um, uh, positive effect in terms of outreach. Uh, I mentioned mobile money accounts. I mentioned QR codes, but I haven't mentioned, for example, uh, I'm not sure if this has been discussed in this conference, but rainfall insurance for, 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 for farmers, for example. Uh, agricultural insurance is uh, notoriously um, uh, difficult to undertake because the, uh, especially for smaller farmers, the verification costs are very high. In process that you use like a, a weather gauge um, or satellite data for um, that are kind of objective uh, data for the weather situation in a specific area, in a small area, then it's much uh, easier to actually verify, uh, uh, monitor and verify and then pay out uh, um, policy, uh, policy events. Um, there are other things, um, I mean, so I have, again, I mentioned I'm not going to talk about the uh, distributed ledger technologies, um, but uh, for smart contracts, they have been used, uh, cross-border payments, if you don't want to go through the dollar uh, payment system, that uh, can be uh, much cheaper. So um, uh, using the user's text messages to, uh, uh, for communication with clients. Uh, I haven't talked about lending platforms, I'm going to talk about the, in, uh, in a later stage. Um, but so again, lots of different ways uh, delivery channels, methodologies, institutional arrangements where digitalization has really had a positive impact on, uh, on, uh, uh, on financial inclusion. Now, one quick uh, word of caution I want to mention is, um, let me just see, yes, um, and uh, on big data. So far, I've been kind of uh, selling you a story that more is always better. So I've given you the, 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 uh, the, the story of Alibaba, for example, and financial. Uh, with the, the QR code and uh, access to more data. And that's basically what we kind of like to think as economists, that um, uh, more data gives more transparency, makes the decision easier. But of course, there's always uh, a way, a uh, counter argument, which is, uh, I want to call this the behavioral view, um, because it allows um, um, more information, allows financial institutions to also exploit behavioral biases of potential clients. And actually, a very interesting paper um, by Antoinette Choa and a co-author uh, looks at credit card offers in the U.S. Now, for those who have uh, uh, spent some time in the U.S., you know that you're going to get, uh, once you live there, after a couple, when you show up in the credit bureau, uh, you get on average three, three four uh, credit card offers per week in your mailbox. Uh, and if you don't get them yourself, then, uh, then they come for your spouse, then they come for your kids, and then they come for your dog or for your cat. Um, so credit card offers is something very, uh, very common in the U.S. Um, and what they basically found in the study by looking at these credit card offers, that credit card firms uh, tailored these offers to the specifics of the area, so not to your specific, but judging from where you live, basically targeting to specific characteristics. So if you live in an area with lots of low income, less educated, therefore financially less sophisticated people, you get a credit card offer which has a teaser rate um, and which has a very low front up costs, but very high back up costs in the sense that if you default, you have a very high penalty rate or very high default costs. And uh, the, the information is being provided in front five or four 
uh, on the last page. If you uh, live in an area with lots of high income, financially more sophisticated people, then you um, uh, get uh, a credit card offer which doesn't have a teaser rate, um, which has maybe a regular interest rate, but then also you don't uh, get the, 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 the penalty rates on other side. And the information is much clearer. Um, so that's an uh, exploitation basically of, uh, um, of uh, behavioral biases. Um, and actually also interestingly enough, in, uh, they also find that in states uh, where there is uh, more generous unemployment insurance, where people are less likely to default uh, when they lose their job, um, that it, uh, this is actually even stronger, this kind of exploitation of behavioral biases, because they know that um, even if you lose your job, you can still pay back, so you can, there's more incentive to exploit this behavioral bias. So, which of course then raises the bigger question, which I, I'm not gonna answer this uh, presentation, this is about who actually owns the data that we provide, because we basically, as soon as you go on the internet, um, uh, you provide data for somebody else. You kind of create this digital footprint. So, who and what drives financial innovation? I've discussed this pretty much already. Um, so, you sometimes you have innovation coming from inside the banking sector. And I think you have an example here in India too. Uh, I just know here an example in, in Kenya, one in Mexico. Um, you can have it from outside. Um, you can have these uh, these like mobile uh, uh, phone companies. Um, you have uh, these smaller fintech companies, which you also talked about during the during these conferences, typically they're small. I mean, so I'm talking primarily now from the European viewpoint, they're typically small. Um, they um, focus on one segment, let's say payment, for example. Um, uh, but there are also lots of lending firms, lending platforms. Um, and then we have, of course, the big tax, which I already mentioned. Um, right, so let me then, this is sort of, now I talked about innovation, I talked about inclusion. Um, I haven't really talked about regulation, that's the next thing I'm going to come to, and I've talked about also inclusion is in a, both in a positive sense, but also a little bit of a cautious uh, uh, remark. Um, let me talk about regulation, and this is actually uh, a report uh, that uh, I co-authored at, uh, at the European Systemic Risk Board, which is kind of a, a macroprudential authority, authority in quotation marks in the, in the European Union, uh, which kind of looks at the implications of digitalization, so it's much broader now, not just fintech, big tech, but digitalization, on the future of, uh, of banking. It's on Europe, but maybe we can also draw some implications for, um, uh, for other parts of the world. And so um, I mentioned already FinTech. So in Europe, at least, FinTech companies are not being really considered anymore as direct competitors. I mean, yes, some of them are competitors, but if they become too competitive, then the banks can just buy them up. Um, sometimes there's even there's a uh, um, um, banks help create ecosystems for fintechs to flourish. So if you go to London uh, in uh, Canary Wharf, um, I think it was um, forgot which of the, the large uh, four banks in, uh, in Great Britain actually has a floor in their building for uh, fintech for small fintech startups that get a, a space to basically work and see whether they function. And if they're very successful, then basically this banks decide to actually buy them up. Um, so yes, there is the risk, of course, with fintech that uh, there is um, um, uh, they kind of attack certain business lines, um, which, which might be then not allowed cross subsidization for banks anymore. Um, there are, of course, also uh, fintechs that turn into banks. Uh, so in uh, in uh, Europe, we have N24 in Germany, we have Revolut, um, which, but still, they're not full fledged banks quite yet. They just still focus on specific uh, segments or specific services. So, but in general, fintech from the bank's viewpoint are not really seen as the major competitor. That might be again different in other countries such as South Africa or such as uh, uh, India, um, but from European viewpoint, that's uh, um, how it works. It's also that um, uh, in some countries, in some jurisdictions, these fintechs actually have gone through a whole cycle already. So this is a graph out of a BIS paper um, that basically shows the rise and the fall of lending platforms in China, uh, which again, very successful at the beginning in the uh, uh, 10 years ago, lots of these popping up and then lots of them failing and ultimately lots of them exiting because they were just not sustainable. So that uh, is of course a question, will we see something similar in other parts of the world or will this actually serve as a uh, kind of a cautious lesson for other, for other parts of the world? So, um, on the other hand, big techs, that's quite a scene as a very different um, uh, animal in terms of also both as potential cooperator, but also a potential competitor. And I think actually yesterday uh, the, the deputy uh, governor already mentioned uh, some of these issues. Um, so we have them 
across the world, across the globe. Actually, in Europe, we don't have any homemade ones. We use uh, primarily American ones. But uh, for example, in, in, in Latin America, there's one called Macao Libre, which is an e-commerce platform. Um, and you could argue, I mean, yes, more competition, um, more stability. That's actually something good. Or it could be that if banks feel attacked, like uh, Isaac mentioned yesterday, then actually they, they might defend, banks might defend their franchise value by taking more risks. There's definitely a concentration risk. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, many of these uh, big techs have a dominating uh, uh, position in their respective markets. And also, as I mentioned earlier, digitalization as such leads to more arm's length, to more transaction-based lending, which can be good because it reduces the reliance on connections, um, personal connections. But of course, it also might make it actually more procyclical because uh, it's easier to increase lending during the upturn and reduce it during a downturn. There are lots of um, new risks. On the one hand, you could argue that, and I've, I've just mentioned this already, um, more competition from big techs might result in more risk taking by banks. But also, if they actually start cooperating, so think about um, a, uh, a big tech um, using their data to analyze credit risk, and then it's the bank who underwrites the loan. Um, the incentives are very different ones. The big tech has an incentive to go for volume. And that this can go wrong, we've seen in 2007, 8 uh, in the US, uh, as somebody yesterday correctly called the North Atlantic crisis. We'd like to think about it as the global financial crisis. Um, right, so there are, there are definitely risks coming from that. But also, actually, there are so-called non-financial risks. And I think some of them have also been mentioned yesterday. Um, for example, um, there is a lot of um, financial, a lot of digitalized, uh, digital services that are now being outsourced. For example, cloud computing. Well, what happens if one of these um, um, breaks? It's outside the banking system, right? Who actually uh, supervises them? Um, there might also be the kind of over reliance on uh, um, artificial intelligence, thinking that well, the machine knows everything better, which might not always be right, and which might also. Uh, we know, of course, also that these models depend a little bit from the starting view, from the starting point. APIs, great invention, allows also for open banking, open finance, um, which again is a big discussion in Europe right now, allows uh, lots of uh, players to communicate with each other, but also gives, of course, rise to spillover effects, for example, in the, in the, in the case of uh, uh, cyber attacks, which is a problem more generally. And then, of course, you can say that um, uh, as we rely more and more on machines, um, basically, the machine replaces the trust in a central authority, such as a central bank, for example, which can, of course, um, uh, can also be have um, uh, it raises issues in terms of uh, accountability, but also raises risk in terms of when this technology becomes obsolete. So, <clears throat> I want to provide you um, with three um, kind of uh, scenarios of what could happen. And again, these are scenarios for Europe. We can think about, we can discuss how this would look like, for example, in a large emerging market as uh, India, for example, um, uh, where I think actually things are much more fluent than in, uh, in Europe, where there's much more kind of entrenchment, I think, of certain structures. Um, so the first kind of uh, uh, scenario, and again, I'm not putting any probabilities, by the way. I'm just saying this is three possible scenarios. Um, one is basically, I would like to call it the status quo plus, um, which is what we've seen already. Um, where banks basically maintain their big position, their, their, their dominant position, and new providers are basically being incorporated into the existing banking system, either being bought up or where they go into an immediation, they have to take a banking license. Um, but um, it's the big techs are being kept out because they don't get access to the, uh, the central bank uh, clearance and payment systems. And their idea of creating stable coins such as uh, uh, Libra and DM are basically being kind of uh, shut down. So they cannot really create alternative uh, payment and clearance systems. Um, there might be a possible cooperation between big tech and, uh, and traditional banks, again, with the possible risks that I just uh, mentioned earlier. So that's one scenario that we can think of. We can think of a second scenario where basically uh, big techs take a much bigger role, um, where big techs, like in China, for example, will offer financial services through regulated subsidiaries and capture certain segments of the market which rely more on hard data. So you can think about uh, consumer credit, mortgage credit, maybe certain parts of small business credit, not necessarily wealth, wealth management or large uh, corporation. 
and uh, the banking system is basically then limited to um, um, to what I, what I like to call relationship intensive services. So it could be local banks, think credit unions, cooperative banks, um, or the high end investment banks, wealth management, and so on. And um, there will be, of course, then also a very structural change in the in the financial system. So that's my kind of a second scenario. Um, and I'm not, by the way, I'm not making any uh, normative statements about whether this, as any of these, is good or bad. The third scenario is, um, and we mentioned, we discussed it already yesterday, is a kind of radical shift away from the current system through the introduction of central bank digital currencies. Now, it doesn't have to be radical, but it can be radical. Uh, it can be especially radical if it's um, if it uh, also comes with a kind of easing out of cash and moving more and more to uh, uh, well, digital cash, basically central bank digital currencies. And here. Um, and again, I'm not making statements whether this is, is good or bad, but um, uh, banks will come under pressure because a central bank digital currency is always considered safer than any deposit whatsoever. And so far, in the current system, it's the deposit which is kind of considered the more the digitally speaking most, uh, most sa the safest form because it's covered by the uh, by deposit insurance or it's covered by other guarantees, be it a government-owned bank or um, uh, big, yeah. Um, so, with central bank digital currencies, that would be kind of a strong competitor for bank deposits. It would raise funding costs for banks. It might also make the, the funding base, the deposit base of banks, much more volatile. And it would also, during bad times, um, not uh, per se the banking system can be an anchor of stability, but the banking system plus the financial safety net by the central bank makes the banking system typically a very uh, safe anchor during, uh, during crisis time. That would basically go away because it would be the CBDC who would be the anchor, not the banking system anymore. Um, which also would mean that, of course, with higher funding costs, the banks would take on maybe a smaller role in intermediation, new providers basically again popping in. So again, this is something that we can think of, whether this is something positive or not. But again, when we talk about CBDCs and advantages and risks, we have to talk also about the risks and the, the structural changes that it might actually imply. So let me um, come to my conclusions for this part. Um, and again, so here, I, as you can see, I've taken on a much more kind of skeptical view on terms of stability and regulatory implications. Um, so one thing I want to f say first up is that, of course, any development in the financial system, including these three scenarios, are, of course, endogenous to what regulators will do. I mean, we've seen it again in China. Big tech had the chance to step in because uh, the regulators let it do it, similar in, uh, in Kenya. In, uh, in, uh, in the US, for example, a backlash against these, uh, these cryptocurrencies because the SEC is basically putting uh, higher um, obligations on them. Uh, Europe, the European Union, we have now all of these new regulations coming on, MICTA and DORA, MICTA and DORA um, which basically regulates these cryptocurrencies and kind of imposes a certain structure on them. So um, one implication that comes out of work here, whatever scenario you like to think about, whatever kind of what you would like to see in terms of financial innovation, is that uh, we have to discuss the regulatory parameter. Who should be regulated, by whom, and who should be therefore also part of the financial safety net. And again, this discussion comes up, especially during crisis situation, 2008, with the money market funds in the US, when they broke the buck and basically had to be guaranteed by the Fed, or the investment banks, which are not under the Fed, but under the ACC, and then basically had to become part of the uh, safety net. So a similar question we have to ask here. Um, if we allow big tech to offer credits through or intermediation services through subsidiaries, what about the ring fencing between the big tech as such, which is much bigger than the small subsidiary that offers the financial services? Cooperation between uh, different uh, regulators, competition, financial, but also across borders. I mean, for us in Europe, this is a big concern because, again, Facebook, PayPal, Google, they don't sit in Europe. They're all headquarters in the US. Yes, they have some kind of uh, subsidiary in Ireland, for example, but they're not being supervised. Um, finally, I mentioned CBDC. Again, if you want to go for CBDC, all fine. Um, if you think that the banks shouldn't have uh, uh, this big of a role anymore, good riddance, okay, fine. But think about the implications in terms of restructuring of banks, retrenchment, exit of banks. That is going to be a, a, a very important topic. So again, this was all 
kind of euro focus apologize for that but i think some of these actually also hold uh, for um for the rest of the world including many emerging markets in terms of policy implications so thank you very much Just wanted to understand uh, in the second paper that you showed uh, with respect to my bank credit to small firms in China, mm -hmm. what are the parameters based on which they decided uh, whether to offer credit to them? To, to the small, is it only based on transactions? Um, 